Okay. Welcome everyone to Mundo Sostenible's second monthly virtual event. We are so happy to see you all here and welcome also to those of you watching this recording that we'll be posting on YouTube and to our website. You can find more information about our organization and our current projects, programs, and initiatives by visiting www.mundosostenible.us.org. My name is Clint Fandrick, the founder of the organization and proud general manager of the project implementation team here in Peru. We are currently in Cusco, the home of the ancient Inca empire, in the midst of a solar energy project development push as part of our current flagship program that we've called Nuestra Energia, or Our Energy. This program targets orphanages, shelters, schools, and other community service centers to install solar energy systems to reduce CO2 emissions and to save monies, money for these facilities that provide badly needed social services to communities across Southern Peru. Uh, through the program, our project partners enjoy a 50% cost share. In other words, our organization pays for half of the project costs. Uh, if this sounds interesting and like something you would like to support, please consider making a tax deductible donation to our organization via our website. Uh, in other news on that front, we have just recently acquired 501c3 status from the IRS. So thank you to all of you for your support uh, as we've worked our way through this challenging experience with Uncle Sam. Uh, these virtual events, as previously mentioned, are in the run-up to fundraising events we are hosting in New York City and Washington, D.C. in late June of this year. So if you're in the area, please join us. Uh, we will be posting updates and registration information on our brand new website. Again, that's www.mundosostenible.us.org. Format of this discussion tonight will be two questions to each panelist with the chance for the other panelists to offer a quick response. There's no time limits. Uh, I won't reduce time if everyone plays nice. We ask that you please remain muted during this time, those of you in the audience. If you would like to submit a question to our panelists, please do so in the chat window in Zoom and my colleague Matt will organize them and uh, I will call on you during question and answer to directly address them to our panelists. So this is our Earth Day event uh, and is particularly in response to the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also known as the IPCC's sixth assessment report that first came out in August of last year with the first working group uh, and has been followed up in recent months by reports from working groups two and three which focused on adaptation and mitigation strategies and effects. So this is what we'd like to talk about tonight. What are the advantages of putting policies and initiatives in place to adapt to the effects of climate change versus efforts to mitigate climate change? So what does that mean, adaptation versus mitigation? So the IPCC defines adaptation as the process of adjustment or uh, to actual or expected climate and its effects. Uh, in, human system, in human systems, adaptation seeks to moderate or avoid harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. The definition of mitigation from the IPC says is uh, a human intervention to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. So I'm going to introduce uh, each of our panelists one by one as I pose our first question to them. So our first question goes to Dr. Susan Clark. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Environment and Sustainability at the University at Buffalo, located in upstate New York. She is also the director of the College of Arts and Sciences Sustainability Leadership Master's Program at UB and chairs Erie County's Community Climate Change Task, Task Force. Dr. Clark's experience and uh, expertise span the topics of sustainability education, climate change policy, sustainable development, and resilient infrastructure systems. Dr. Clark's current research focuses on quantifying the social burden of power outages due to natural disasters and extreme events, something we're very interested in, and uh, 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 power resilience, energy resilience. Uh, she earned her PhD in sustainability from Arizona State University in 2013. So this first question hopes to uh, extend an olive branch between the adaptation and mitigation crowds before we pit one against the other. Uh, so for, for you, Dr. Clark, are there adaptation strategies that broadly incentivize or influence the development of more robust mitigation efforts? For example, is there wisdom behind strict enforcement of forest protections to drive down the emissions profile of food production? Think about clearing the Amazon for beef cattle ranching. 
uh, or are the adaptation and mitigation worlds truly separate? Well, thank you for the introduction, Clint. Um, no pressure, right? I get to go first here. Um, so first of all, uh, I love this question. I wanted to start by saying that I, I do believe efforts related to mitigation, right, are, are important, also urgent, right, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and hopefully, right, someday eliminate these additional greenhouse gases entering into our atmosphere, which are really driving increased global temperatures and other impacts of climate change. However, adaptation is just as important, right? Especially considering that many places are already experiencing the effects of climate change, you know, longer growing seasons, uh, maybe more frequent heat waves, um, smaller snowpacks, all kinds of things, right? And we know that uh, the lifetime or sort of residency, if you will, of greenhouse gases like CO2 is a long time in our atmosphere, you know, on the order of hundreds of years. So even if we eliminate emissions completely today, we'd still be you know, feeling those effects for many, many years to come. So that adaptation to the things we're experiencing and will experience in the near term are really, really important, right? So that being said, I, I definitely agree that adaptation and mitigation are not, they're not really separate, right? There's plenty of examples of ways that we can uh, adapt and mitigate and, and you know, vice versa. So if I came up with, I have three examples that I wanna mention. Um, so one kind of relates to the example that you gave Clint, but so in some of the climate adaptation plans that I'm working on right now in Buffalo, one of the things that we're focusing on is thinking about protecting and conserving forests and vegetation that are sort of already prevalent here in, in our area, but also thinking about strategies to increase, say, urban trees and green spaces and green infrastructure. So that's important because it helps to mitigate because it's a, a way to sequester carbon, right, naturally in, in our system. So that can help mitigate emissions. But it's also really important when you think about uh, extreme heat events or increasing temperatures in our region because vegetation sort of provides a natural cooling. Um, if, you know, if you live near a park, you can get that cooling effect from being near that vegetation. Increased tree canopy can provide shading. So that's a way to sort of adapt to sort of what you're expecting in the future related to climate change, but also mitigating emissions at the same time, right? Um, another example more related to some of my work uh, is microgrids. So microgrids, you usually think of them as a resilience building strategy, helping businesses when there's a disaster and the power goes out, you know, you have a backup system, which is great. But microgrids provide this opportunity to, um, integrate renewable energy sources into that backup system. So you're not only having sort of a backup system for when a disaster like a hurricane happens, which by the way, we're expected to have stronger hurricanes in places in the Caribbean on the East Coast of the United States because of climate change, right? Um, but through microgrids, if we do integrate things like solar, solar energy, hydropower, these are sort of natural ways that when we don't have a disaster, we can increase our renewable energy sources, reducing our emissions, also having that resilience um, impact when those big disaster events happen. Um, I think the third kind of um, maybe more obvious example too is with buildings. So as we retrofit or build new construction, if we weatherize those buildings, so say they're very well insulated, we are reducing energy demand and thus emissions, at the same time making those buildings more um, resilient and adaptable to say future extreme heat or extreme cold type situations what are, which are expected in many regions uh, due to climate change. Um, so those are some examples. I think there's many more out there. Um, but yeah, I think these really show that they're not really separate and we can really consider these things together in sort of win-win type situations. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna give the other panelists a chance to respond, but I have a, I have a quick question about your second point about microgrids. Um, one of the things that we've run into here in Peru, we talk about natural disasters and, and uh, energy resilience is uh, what is the value of power when the grid is out? So here in Peru and, and other places in the developing world, there's a lot of uh, very frequent power outages, either from maintenance or otherwise. Is there any, um, and, and maybe this is something for offline, but is there any literature or or research done or economic analysis done on the value of power when the, the, the utility grids aren't uh, up and running? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of literature and I'd be happy to share some of it. Um, there tends to be a lot on health impacts, right? Morbidity, mortality kind of impacts that you can attach to so like a, uh, an amount to a, a value of life kind of, right? There's lots of um, economic analyses that talk about loss of productivity and sort of business profit losses. Um, some of the work that I do in this space looks at the social burden of uh, power outages. So how are like vulnerable households in rural communities impacted in terms of their ability to meet uh, you know, critical needs. Uh, and so anyway, there's lots of literature out there and it's really important, right? Because you kind of have to make the business case of why something investing in something like a microgrid is actually worth it for uh, a disaster type scenario. But I'll just add that the, this sort of option of bringing in renewable energy sources and using that as sort of a, a benefit every day not only when a disaster happens is one of those things that allows um, the investment in something like a microgrid much more attractive and, and reasonable, you know? Excellent. Uh, Chris or Adam, do you have any comments on that question? The only thing I was thinking about <clears throat> was, excuse me, I do not consider myself to be a technology person. So, um, Susan, um, when we're talking about the, your, your forest in that area, I was working on my PhD at University of Northern British Columbia. So I was really up in the forest, you know, and there were a lot of things there, but um, how much of it should, can we look at not just reforestation, but afforestation? Uh, because obviously our cities have, displaced force that was already there. So I'm not even sure, that's not my area of expertise, but I'm not sure how much afforestation is going to be viable at this point. I think it's a good point. Um, you know, most of my work tends to focus more on urban areas. And so um, when we talk about um, the increasing the number of trees or vegetation, we're really talking about um, like tree planting initiatives in more urban, areas or just sort of increasing green spaces, parks, um, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not really like using large scale pieces of land and just planting a lot of trees, right? It's sort of integrating um, that within our urban sort of livables. Um, so that I think is very viable. I, don't, I know less about sort of the larger scale, I guess, the afforestation type initiatives. Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna move on to our, our set. Oop, is there another comment? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna move on to our second question. Uh, and this one is for Mr. Chris Larson. So Chris comes to us with a bachelor's of science in education with an emphasis on environmental studies from Northern Arizona University. Uh, also, he has a master's uh, of natural resources from Virginia Tech and uh, is a PhD student of natural resources and environmental studies with a focus in permafrost melt implications for indigenous cultures and boreal forest ecosystems. So, uh, so Chris, I realize you're not an economist, but uh, many developed countries uh, have arrived at their status as having rich, stable economies, at least in part because of some degree of environmental degradation. So um, this could be anything from significant consumption of fossil fuels to wide scale logging and deforestation kind of to your previous point. So um, now that we see some of these same activities ramping up in developing places, you know, China, India, Brazil come to mind, um, what should be the message to developing countries around the world like Peru as well um, regarding how to develop these economies? Um, you know, can we can we really ask them not to take the established path to development? Um, so, what do you think about that? I know that's a big question, but uh, give me your give me your. Th well, like you said, I'm not an economist, but I do play one on TV, so we're going to try to tackle this. Um, here are some points that I actually took some took, thought about this for a while because this is specifically not my my strong suit, but I think that. Adam, having been a mentor of mine in the past as well, uh, would probably understand where I'm coming from on this point. But um, I think it's important that we go back to the fact that since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, it's the developed countries from the US, Canada, Australia, well, more recently, of course, Europe, 
uh, England, obviously, where this whole thing began, that are responsible for the vast majority of atmospheric carbon forcing overall, somewhere between 70 and 79, 75 and 79 percent. Um, that said, today we have developing countries like here in Peru that are going to be facing some of the worst impacts from this, right? And, and so looking at it from that perspective on the economy, it becomes a real problem because, for instance, uh, Peru's economy right now is coming back from the problems of the pandemic because Peru is one of the worst hit countries in the world and economically and, and in human costs. Um, but Peru for the last more than a decade has been having a water boom. And that has helped with normal development of the economy and industry. We have one of the largest copper mines right here outside of Arequipa, which is um, run by an American company who pays a fee to the government, a percentage for that. But they have water rights here. And we are in just north of the Atacama Desert. And here, of course, we get only in the neighborhood of two inches of rain per year on average. So Arequipa, and most people don't understand in the case of Peru, for instance, here we have a developing country, which even when the US faced a large economic downturn uh, a decade ago or so, or a little more than that, I'm getting old, wow. Well, but the Peru continued to grow throughout that whole time. We fell to like two or 3% per year, but we were still growing every year. And part of it is this water boom because we have so much water in those watersheds as far as our frozen water in the um, Andean glaciers. The problem is this water boom, which is helping us to be able to have these huge mines and being able to have more industry on the coast. We are a desert. The whole Western part of Peru is a desert and we depend completely on that. And right now, um, between 20, 20, or 2000 and 2021, Peruvian glaciers have shrunk at around three feet per year of thickness. And it has ended up causing us to lose already more than one third of our glaciers in just two decades. And no mountain region in the world has lost more water than the Andes. So how does that impact moving forward? Well, obviously we have a huge there when it comes to how do you continue to sustain economic growth and development when our entire global model is based on an unsustainability, right? It's all about consumption and continuing to grow like an economy and to continue to use fossil fuels in order to do that. And even here in Arequipa, I can say, I, I got back and the day after I got back, there was a huge uh, protest of anyone who, truck drivers and taxi drivers and bus drivers, et cetera, because the price of gas was so high and they were blaming the president. And they were demanding it to be lowered and they don't understand the dynamics involved there and it's hitting them in the financial financially right in the wallet moving forward i think and this is just my opinion right but i think one of the things we need to consider is should china be still considered a developing nation because i understand they were not part of the original group of developing countries that, that forced most of that carbon into the atmosphere and it created the situation. But at the same time, it has grown immensely in the last 30 years and is now responsible for 27% of atmospheric forcing because it has become such an industrial powerhouse. And to understand the complexity there, a country with the largest population, 27%, India right there next to them in population with only 6.6%, .6%, the U.S. around 11 percent. Um, so I think that that's a question that needs to be looked at. Now, there are initiatives that are being done in developing parts of the world, like in the EU, to reduce carbon footprint. And they've been successful, but they also have the, the financial ability and they have the intellectual capacity as far as they have the people who are trained and educated in these fields in order to be able to handle this. And they've reduced their footprint by like 13 percent in the last few years. So I think that one of the biggest things that we need to consider is exactly this, this issue, right? Um, 
where does China fit in all of this? And how much is fair for us to expect the developing world to change their model and how they, be, they try to grow their wealth when we say, well, they say to us, but you didn't do that. We wanna use the same model you did because that was the cheapest way for you to become a wealthy nation and your people to prosper. So why can't we do it? And you be the ones who do the change, right? You change first, let us change later once we catch up to you. And of course, we know that, I mean, wars and arguments, it, it, these things tend to not really work out well. I do wanna share with you at this point, this, this one graph, because I think that if you look at this graph, you'll see that it's important to understand, and this is the last point on this question, but it's important for you guys to understand that this part here, this is the developed world. This is how much of the today in 2022, this is how much carbon forcing, atmospheric carbon forcing is, is the developing world is responsible for. And if you see China here and then India, they're a huge portion of it now because they're trying to use older models like coal, et cetera, to, be, to catch up to the developed world so that they can then feel that they are in the right place compared to all others. But even if you look at like here, Latin America, I don't think most of us realize that Latin America's footprint is about the same as the European Union, which I mean, economically, there's a massive difference there, right? So we clearly need to have more education, uh, more, I think that there needs to be investment from developing countries or from wealthy countries who will then allow the best and brightest of the students to come to their countries and train for free and return home to be able to help implement these things. But we also have to see that there is, I believe the that these countries over here owe it to all of the rest of the world here to invest in helping them to make this transition. Because if they don't, that's impossible. And if that doesn't happen, that means we're not gonna meet those, those um, targets that we must meet by 2030. And then we're all down the tubes with it, right? I mean, then, then we're really starting to face the fact that we're gonna pass 1.5 degrees Celsius and there's gonna be a lot of issues to deal with. More when it comes to both mitigation and adaptation. Chris, thank you. Susan or Adam, do you have any comments on that front? I know it's the economic question is a bit of a, a, a tough one, but. I don't have a whole lot. That was uh, pretty well said, Chris. I, I agree with most, obviously, of what you say, but uh, not everything. But we'll, we'll elaborate a little further on, I think. Well, and, we, and, and I, might, I wanted to add this, too, for everyone that's listening. Uh, the passion that I put into this is that um, I'm a enrolled member of the Midwakanton, Dakota of Minnesota. My father was born and raised, died and buried, along with my grandparents and all three of my siblings, all on the reservation. And so I come at this from the perspective here in Peru of seeing the, the impact on indigenous communities and the fact that there's still such a tremendous need globally for indigenous people to be provided with more opportunity to, to succeed. The latest IPCC report also had a uh, pretty strong emphasis on indigenous populations yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I had a couple of comments. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, it's hard because this is a really complicated topic. I touched upon my dissertation quite a bit. Um, so I take a little bit of a different, I guess, perspective, although I completely agree with everything Chris just said. Um, but I think part of the problem is the way that we measure and define development. And it tends to be around economic terms, right? So looking at GDP or other measures of income primarily, right? But if we look at some other metrics about development, so I focus on human development in particular, which has, it's a little bit more holistic, right? It includes income, but it has like health and education and other kind of metrics in there that we can consider. And so when you consider uh, metrics that bring in, I guess, a more holistic picture, it kind of changes the relationship that you see between CO2 emissions and development. And you start to see that, in fact, countries like the United States or other developed nations who are responsible for contributing most of the emissions historically can actually reduce its emissions, at least theoretically, and achieve relatively similar levels in human development, 
where you see countries that are emitting the least amount, at least per capita, see the greatest returns in their development for the emissions that they're creating. So anyway, it's another way to look at and measure development differently that I think just supports everything Chris just said, Justin's kind of like different terminology and almost like a moral responsibility to decrease our emissions so that those nations have that opportunity, even if they have to increase emissions for a short amount of time to reach a sort of a minimum sufficient level of human development for like a high quality of life. Um, so tried to summarize that. I could go on and on about it, but that's sort of the quick version. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. Okay, uh, so our third question is for Dr. Adam Kalkstein, and I'm sorry this is a little bit long. Um, Dr. Kalkstein is very, very, uh, is, is got a very impressive resume here. So Please keep it he short. is a <laughs> scientist with research interests focusing on climate change and human health. Uh, Dr. Kalkstein uh, received a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Sciences from the University of Virginia and his Master's and PhD in Geography and Climatology from Arizona State University. Current uh, research projects include a three-year National Research Council and U.S. Army Research Laboratory study examining the impact of cool, dry air on influenza in the Southwest U.S., uh, an examination of heat on U.S. soldiers, the impact of weather and climate on suicide rates across the United States, which when Matt and I read that, we were like, wow, and looked into it. It's pretty fascinating. And uh, fluctuating tropical cyclone patterns in the Northern Atlantic Ocean. Recently, Dr. Kalkstein was selected by the World Meteorolo 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 Meteorological Organization to serve on a commission for climatology. Further, Dr. Kalkstein served as subject matter expert for an Army Science Board climate change study and acted as an official US government reviewer for the IPCC's fifth assessment report, uh, working group two. So Dr. Kalkstein is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering at the United States Military Academy and holds an additional position at Virginia Tech. So um, Dr. Kalkstein, to you, uh, as the impacts of climate change increase, uh, particularly around the tropics uh, and in developing places, is there a need to modify or expand healthcare infrastructure in particular, or make other considerations for adaptation to protect human health as climate change impacts progress? Thank you for the question and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, the answer to that is in short is, is yes. Um, it is always beneficial to increase medicine, to increase awareness, to increase education. Um, and I, where I think I might differ with, with, with some other folks is that I think that's important, you know, independent of climate change and that yes, climate change is absolutely making things worse. But in many ways, we've been able, at least technologically speaking, to almost overcome the changes that we're seeing in our environment. And let's take, you know, heat related illness. I look at heat as probably the leading killer in the United States, the leading weather related killer in the United States. Heat related mortality has been going down consistently for years, and that's in face of a warming climate. Why? Well, we have better warning systems today, better awareness. Everybody has air conditioning, which is huge. So we take all of these things into account. And for the time being, at least, advances in medicine, awareness, education, warning systems, those have all been able to keep pace. Um, globally, you can look at something like malaria, uh, which is also over the past decades has been on the decline. And, you know, as the latest IPCC report makes clear, malaria is expected to get worse under a warming climate, yet despite that, malaria continues to drop in the face of climate change. So independent of climate change, I think better medicine, better warning systems, um, absolutely better healthcare, that's important no matter what. And I think that should be the focus. Um, and look, as the climate continues to warm, that's only going to make us more resilient um, as well. So it's, a, it's kind of a win-win if you ask me. Great. Chris or, or Susan, do you have a comment on healthcare? All right. Way out of my league. Not, <laughs> not my path. I will say some of the work I've done recently, particularly in Puerto Rico and thinking about impacts of power outages uh, is looking at um, access to healthcare in particular as sort of a critical need for households and 
So you can think about how different types of households and different types of communities may or may not lack sort of access to healthcare um, facilities, especially like rural populations, for example, you know, roads are closed, uh, what have you, um, you just don't have the same sort of access. And so just thinking about that in the context of um, power outages and other types of disaster events um, becomes increasingly important, especially for those really vulnerable populations. So um, anyway, just something that I'm more recently digging into. That's so important as well. I mean, the opening of shelters, air conditioned shelters and a heat wave. I mean, that saves dozens and dozens and dozens of lives in the United States. Um, so something that simple, um, even just a basic buddy system, checking on your neighbors, make sure everybody's doing okay. And that holds true for many natural disasters. Um, so simplistic things make huge differences on the ground. Now, it's, it's just, though, Adam, that you mentioned that because I was thinking earlier today that uh, I wanted to put on something warm before I sat down here because it's getting evening and in Peru, we don't have heat, we don't have air conditioning, we don't have dryers in our houses. I mean, you know, and so it, it's a, it may be just how much of it can be applied in that, those cases to the developing world. That's my concern is that when it, when it gets too hot and, and 30 years from now, et cetera, we don't have those infrastructures in place, right? So at the rate of growth, I would hope in 30 years that most people do have regular access to air conditioning. In the United States, we're just about at air conditioning saturation. Um, and in fact, the latest research is showing that, you know, I've been saying that heat related mortality continues to go down. It's gone down, down, now it's flattening out. Um, so I have a feeling that we're maybe hitting that point. And malaria, by the way, is doing the same thing. We're at that point where I think technologically, we might be getting close to being maxed out. Um, and now climate change might start to play a larger role, but I'm certainly hoping in the developing world um, where there may not be access to air conditioning today, I'm hoping in, that that changes in the not terribly distant future. And, you know, with the economic growth that you were describing, um, hopefully that's not unrealistic. Interesting. And I, I just as a comment to that, there was a, 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 some literature on the climate effect of just cooling systems and how um, counteracting that uh, solar makes a lot of sense because obviously during the day when there's the most heat, um, solar can respond to, to cooling needs. Interesting, very good, very good. Okay, so we're at the halfway point. I just wanna have a, uh, set out a reminder to those of you in the audience, if you'd like to submit a question, uh, my colleague Matt is fielding questions as we speak. And uh, uh, we just would like to, to see the questions first and then we'll call on you during uh, Q&A after this next round of questions. We're still good on time. So thank you all for your succinct answers. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Clark. Um, so going, going back to your, your comments about uh, uh, urban systems and, and the effects of climate change and the role that urban systems play. So urban areas globally are expected to continue increasing CO2 emissions well into the coming decades as levels of urbanization rise, particularly again in developing places. So what are some of the options that cities have to reduce their emissions profiles? You mentioned uh, green spaces. Are there other options that cities have at their disposal? Yeah, there's a lot of options. Um, I'll just cover maybe some of the key ones. Um, obviously, I think uh, the more you can move towards renewable energy sources becomes really important here. And even if the city doesn't have control necessarily of where its energy comes from, it might have control over, you know, how it's purchasing its energy, or you know, the types of sources that it's it's purchasing, um, or sort of encouraging rooftop solar of its residents or businesses, right? And so you can think about smaller scale, maybe ways to integrate renewable energy uh, to reduce the carbon footprint of of that area. Um, transportation is a big, um, you know, sector that that we need to reduce emissions from. So. Transitioning towards electric vehicles, I think, is really important, especially since we have more control over, you know, how we can source that from clean and renewable energy sources, and just offering more like public transportation options in general, um, and also like biking lanes, um, you know, walkways, things. So people have choices of how they can get from place to place, other than sort of a fossil fuel dependent, you know, motor vehicle. Um, we've mentioned buildings. I think that's really important. Weatherization, obviously, but um, also just uh, you know energy efficient appliances um, in places where it's cold, like Buffalo, where, where I live. Uh, heating is really important. So uh, converting to heat pumps reduces a lot of 
energy usage in buildings. Um, another big area is waste. So the more that we can con uh, uh, convert our waste to, uh, you know, away from landfills, for example, or, or um, incineration, right? So if we can do more recycling, more reuse, more comp composting, or just considering our consumption levels to begin with, right, and reducing that can reduce what sort of ends up in our landfill. Um, let's see, food systems. So eating more locally, sourcing our food more locally means things aren't traveling by truck most of the time from far away places, and that can uh, reduce our carbon footprint and improve food security as well. Um, the last thing I'll say is carbon offsets. I think that's one of the things that we overlook sometimes, but some emissions are just really hard to reduce or eliminate. But we can, you know, invest in, you know, tree planting initiatives somewhere else or helping other communities invest in renewable energy sources that can sort of offer a net zero, right? Uh, you know, ability to reduce our emissions even if we can't locally eliminate those emissions. So those are a couple of examples. Uh, again, I think there's many more, but I think some of the major ones that I've seen and talk about a lot with um, the community that I work in. Great. Comments from the other panelists, Chris or Adam? I just want to add maybe a slightly different viewpoint in that I always look at urban environments as actually being more environmentally friendly than many places out, you know, at least here in the suburbs or further away from the city. Um, you know, locally, uh, there are a lot of folks that are cutting down trees and putting up townhomes and, you know, multi unit housing and everybody in the suburbs is up in arms. How could you do this? How could you make these, these ugly buildings? They look terrible. It looks awful for the environment. I bet their carbon footprint is probably half of mine, quite frankly. Um, so it's, I always look at, you know, urban areas as, as more environmentally friendly, even though it, it, it might not always appear that way. One other comment I wanna make um, is that again, getting back to my small things comment, it's, it always seems to me that, you know, at least, up in the Northeast in the winter time, somehow our buildings are always, you know, burning hot. I'm always taking off shirts and layers in the middle of the winter in the building. And, you know, and then in the summer, I'm freezing cold, like shivering. I mean, what are we doing here? I mean, something so simple, I think, could make a, a pretty substantial impact um, in terms of energy savings and carbon emissions. I was going to add that, uh, Susan, that I think that I love the idea of carbon offsets, obviously. I mean, it can be a very effective tool. However, human nature, again, and my, my biggest concern, I mean, if, in, if at the end of this year, for instance, in, in the U.S., I'm, not, I'm in Peru right now, but in the U.S., if the my minority party takes control of the House and Senate, nothing like, you know, nothing's going to get passed. Uh, the same thing with like in France right now with their election and, and the war itself uh, and everyone saying, my concern is human nature, which I, I think that'll be more what I go into in my second question. But um, I mean, we obviously we have the, the means and the knowledge to know how to do this. Do we have the will? Yes, I, I, I'm looking forward to your second question. I, sorry, Susan, do you want to respond? I was just gonna, I was just gonna agree to say, you know, um, carbon offsets in some ways provides, I guess, maybe a band aid or kind of a, a way out a little bit, right? So mm -hmm. I completely agree. I guess um, there's ways to make it maybe more responsible, like maybe more local investments or things that you can do locally that help mitigate, but also adapt. Uh, so anyway, there's ways around it maybe that make it a little bit uh, maybe more responsible. Great. Um, so Dr. Kalkstein, I, I guess this will be a good time to go on to our second question here for you. Um, so this goes back to the very first question about economics and um, you know economic equality, climate justice between um, countries that have been responsible for historic emissions versus those who are trying to develop now and experiencing kind of the, the, the largest impacts of climate change. Um, what is the alternative to promised and unkept uh, commitments by developed countries to fund 
the development of clean energy infrastructure in particular, uh, again, this is more on the, on the side of, uh, of mitigation, or adaptation of efforts in developing countries. In other words, if governments in rich and powerful countries uh, can't come through for the energy transition, as it were, what options do we have? Thank you again for the great question. Uh, to start, honestly, the work that your organization is doing sounds incredibly impressive. Um, it sounds like it's doing a lot of good. Um, and honestly, organizations like that make a huge difference. And unfortunately, especially with global politics right now and world events, climate change is certainly going to be put on the back burner. There's, there's no question about that. Um, so I do think that developing nations are, I don't want to say you're going to have to go it alone, but perhaps more so than had originally been anticipated, I would say. Um, but again, beyond that, there are simple solutions. I, I tend to, you know, unlike Chris, I tend to be a little bit of a more optimistic. I, I look at, I'm a technological optimist. And, you know, adding on what Dr. Clark was just saying um, in terms of urban areas, small things go a long way. I'm currently working with a student uh, looking at reflective roof tiles. They cool off roofs dramatically. So if we can cool off our cities, for example, our urban areas that are hotter, and that's right where most people live, in essence, you're, you're delaying global warming. Imagine you can curl, cool off an urban area by one or two degrees Celsius. Well, for that location, in essence, you've delayed global warming by literally 50 years. Um, so I realize that's a temporary Band-Aid, but small, relatively inexpensive things like that could go a long way. And hopefully that would reduce the dependence on you know, wealthier nations um, to help those that you know perhaps less wealthy. Great, really quickly, I have a, I have a follow-up question for that. Um, when I was finishing up at University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, Michael Mann had come to give a talk and I, I basically posed this question to him. And his presentation was about the frustrations that he was experiencing from the lack of uh, political action, policymaking from um, the, the developed places in the world, um, particularly some of the, uh, I guess it depends on your opinion, but failures of the Paris Agreement uh, and others like it uh, since and before. Um, you know, is there really a pathway to climate action that's effective if governments aren't involved? In other words, can non-governmental entities really carry this burden? I'd have to say yes. Um, the reason being in that all these technological advancements, that's going to be primarily done by private enterprise. Granted, there's going to be some government assistance along the way, um, but I look at the best technology at present and the government only had a very limited role in, in developing much of these technologies. So I tend to be an optimist. I think, I think the answer is yes, that there are other entities out there that you know, can take the lead, can help out. Um, yeah, I think that's a short answer. Uh, much more, and even, you know, look, getting back to something Chris was saying with, with water issues, even there, I'm a huge optimist. Um, I spent a year abroad in the Middle East and, you know, about a decade ago um, when I was in the Middle East, water was a huge issue, huge issue. The last time I was there a few years ago, totally different feel. Why? Because of new technology advancements. Um, so I find that to be incredible. And I'm hoping that can continue uh, to play a role. Um, yeah, so much I could say with energy and beyond, but I, I think I'll cut it off uh, with that. Great. Comments from Susan or Chris? Well, Adam will probably expect me to respond because while uh, he would be my... Uh, he was my mentor uh, through all my climate change research and everything at Virginia Tech. Um, we, we definitely have a different way of how we see the world and, and, and that's good because we've been able to push that back and forth. Um, yeah, I, I think that you're right, Adam, that, that, we, that technology is gonna be part of the free market system and the potential to make billions or trillions of dollars. My concern is, Will policy push hard enough? Will the politicians push hard enough for us to replace fossil fuels before we reach those tipping points? You know, I, if we're looking at the at the sixth uh, report and the the message there and the 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 change in tone being so dramatically different that we're saying, look, it's it's due now or or it's too late. You know, and then if we if we pass those tipping points and the politicians, because they want to stay in power, refuse to 
do anything but push for cheap gas, cheap oil. Um, I'm just worried that, I don't know, 56 years on the planet and I feel like um, I, I got a good feel for human nature and it worries me. So, to, I mean, any, any solution though has to be economically feasible. People, you know, unfortunately, they're affected more by their wallets than environmentalism and everybody Absolutely. talks a good game, but unless it's affordable, unless it's easy, people aren't going to implement a change in policy. So right. ultimately any solution has to be doable. And, and that's ultimately what it comes down to. Yeah. Great. Okay, our last question tonight is for Chris. So the latest IPCC report, uh, assessment report six, has a decidedly different tone and use of language compared to previous reports uh, about what can be done about climate change, what the effects are, what the kind of the, the future outlook is. Uh, I, I spent the last several weeks kind of just pouring through it and, and seeing a, a, a decided change in language and tone. Um, what does this mean uh, and, and how does it change the approach to either mitigation or adaptation strategies? Okay, first of all, Again, I'm a mere master's degree holder with, with two years of a PhD under my belt. Um, I'd like to address this from a perspective that I kind of alluded to when I was talking there uh, about Adam's last question. My concern in all of this comes down to human nature. Now, don't get me wrong, I think uh, Adam is right in, in giving you kudos. Uh, what you're, I, I've known you, Clint, for a while, for a few years, and I know the work you're doing here in Peru, and it, it's fabulous, and I hope a lot of people support you in it. Really do. But my biggest concern is, are we going to have enough people who are doing that, who are making those positive changes, who are, or are they going to just focus on themselves, their lives, their wallet, and and if you're on the poor end of the spectrum, of course you are, because you have to worry about survival and your children before you're going to worry about anything ethereal in your mind is something like this. Um, but what about the millionaires, the billionaires, the politicians, the corporations, for instance, in the US, who will then continue to lobby and, and pay for everything to be blocked as much as they possibly can? And, I, and so as we look at mitig mitigation adaptation strategies, one thing that my supervisor for my PhD program, and, and she's in her 60s, hopefully she doesn't be to say that. Um, she's always said, bring these patients her, and I'm telling her, I'm seeing the data for permafrost melt and the potential of a methane bomb, and it's all over. And she's like, well, what are we going to do? Just quit. You just want to quit? Maybe we'll just go get you know, go crawl in a hole and die. We can't quit. We have to keep trying. We have to keep trying to work on the politicians, corporations to understand the profit potential that's there and the danger. Because it, it, the one thing, not be used fossil fuels essentially. Okay. Either we will adapt and negate we will make those changes that are necessary to survive and keep the biosphere intact, or the biosphere will fall, it will collapse, and it will take human civilization. But I, I do not believe we'll be using fuels in the next century. Okay. My concern, my concern is human nature. And all of those who are watching, I know you're not part of this, but my concern is that we need to think, first of all, humans, we think on a human time scale. We think of that E5 as a long time, but at 56 now, it seems like yesterday I was in the Air Force and I was 20. It doesn't seem that long ago. So the problem is, of course, we when 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 people on the far right want to argue that it's the silly nonsense, whatever, we're looking at it on a human time on days and weeks and months and years, and they're not able to see geologic time in comparison what how does the climate change over geologic time that's a very different picture than what we have done by atmospheric carbon forcing the other thing i think is it's the tragedy of the commons. and if you're not 
If you don't know the tragic commons, basically it's economic theory from uh, 1800s, but basically in our case, it comes down to if you have an open field, if you have a resource that's available to everyone and they don't own it and they're responsible for it, they will just use it, abuse it, and then it's left for anyone. And in the case of carbon forcing and our own individual, collective, global, et cetera, uh, print, that is the perfect example for tragedy of the commons because we don't see it. We don't measure it. Most humans will never measure how much CO2 is here, methane, or how much <clears throat> water vapor. So my, we must continue, absolutely, continue to work on it. We must continue type of things you're doing, Clint, your organization, worry that we are fighting a battle that we must find a way to get out to everyone that has to change. Uh, I, I kind of end on, and that was that this past week, uh, I've seen the story about uh, Dr. Kalmus, works at JP out in California for NASA, he works as a climate and he was arrested along with other climate scientists who were uh, protesting the, the lack of action of the administration over it. And he was quoted as saying, we're heading for an African catastrophe and you're not doing anything about it. So I, I do think we need to keep in mind that we must be the tip of the spear. We must continue to push forward with soldiers in this fight. Um, that it is guaranteed that we're going to that doesn't mean that we can we, we, we let go. Uh, Dr. Jim Skay, co-chair of PCC Working Group 3, I'll, I'll finish on this. His quote in, in the report says, climate change is a result of more than a century of unsustainable energy and land use, and of consumption and production. And I continue. Well, that's it. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, comments from Susan and Adam. Yeah, I've got a couple of comments. Um, so this topic really reminds me of the work that Andrew Hoffman does at the University of Michigan. Um, he's, he talks about climate change as being a, more of a cultural issue um, than a, you know, a scientific one. And so I think in some respects, this more urgent language from the IPCC is in some ways just preaching to the choir. Um, and it's telling, you know, showing more scientific evidence, more graphs, sort of more scientific proof that this thing is happening, which we know isn't really going to convince those folks who aren't reading that stuff or who sort of aren't probably, you know, keeping their eye on those types of reports. Um, and so Andrew Hoffman talks about the need to create a social consensus, is what he calls it, around climate change. And you know you have a social consensus when you can bring up the topic at like, your family dinner table and people aren't gonna walk away mad, right? And we're not quite there yet around the topic of climate change, but he says drawing from things like psychology and social science and things that basically we need to make the, the argument around climate change align with people's beliefs and with their values. So we have to make the economic case for it, or um, we have to have folks that they trust or look up to, celebrities that they like, you know, talk about the issue of climate change. Um, so until we're able to reach people, I think, and align with their values, we probably won't reach the social consensus that we really need to move, move things forward. Um, and so that's where I think the really challenging work is, is how do we get enough of a consensus to move forward? We don't need everybody, right? We just need most people to be on board. Um, yeah, Chris, I, I, I'm, I, and I, I agree with what you were saying. We do have to keep pushing forward, moving forward, um, but it doesn't have to hurt so much. Um, you know, I, I, I still think we have a lot of the technologies that we need already available to us to have make a huge dent in global carbon emissions. Absolutely. I wish there was more political will. I am a huge proponent, for example, That's of it. nuclear power. I, I really believe that nuclear power, it was going to have a minimal carbon impact. Obviously, there are other environmental ramifications. It's not perfect. But the thing is, we could keep our lifestyles mostly intact. And getting back mm -hmm. to what Dr. Clark was saying, that's going to do it. People are going to be helping the environment without even realizing they're helping the environment. So for the skeptics, you know what, if they're getting their power from nuclear, 
they're not going to know the difference. So it's not going to impact them. So it's, it's these solutions don't always have to be the ones that hurt the most. Sometimes it's staring you right in the face and we just got to latch onto it. And I am finding in the climatological community that there is a growing consensus that nuclear energy is a potentially great solution. Uh, nuclear advancement has you know, gone a long way since the 60s and 70s. Um, we've made great strides. And I just wish there was the political will to kind of push us over the edge and, uh, and get it done. So we'll see. I think you see my point in that, that all right, we want to have leader engine that roars and we want to get eight miles to the never giving up our, our fossil or less. There's absolutely no no way that they'll accept something like nuclear because it just scares them. And and on neither side is accepting the logical argument. Do we are we able to meet these people and like you said, Susan, and make consensus with them prior to us tipping points where well we've reached the tipping points we've fallen over the edge. So excellent answers. Thank you all so much for your your comments. It's been fantastic. Thank you for your um, for your patience and and kind of uh, dealing with a virtual event. We've got folks from all over the place uh, coming in and, uh, and and joining this this discussion. So thank you all so much. I'd like to move on to uh, some Q and A. Uh, our first question uh, is from Barrett. Barrett, can you can you unmute and can we hear you? I'm unmuted. There he is. There he is. So you had a question about uh, heating and cooling. I think it was the, the first of a couple questions that you had, had, had posed. Would you like to, to ask your question? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the heating and cooling, I guess my question was, Oh, I think I just typed it in there. I didn't write it. Oh, so is has there been a study to see what it would take to reach a sort of saturation point around the world for everyone to access, to have access to both cooling and heating? Uh, what that would take financially and energy consumption wise around the planet. If that's more directed to, to you, Adam. So, so I do not have a good answer to that at all. I am not familiar with any work. It's going to vary. I imagine so much country uh, to country, um, but no, I do not have a great answer uh, for that. I, I, I wish I had something better. Um, Anybody else want to help me bail, bail me out with that? Uh, is anyone else aware of any research uh, showing what it would take to actually get you know everybody access to air conditioning or heating? Yeah, I don't know if I've seen anything specific to cooling and heating, but I have seen some studies uh, about you know just like energy access more generally. Um, and I don't have off the top of my head what that saturation point is. Um, but if I find that that paper or those couple of papers, I'd be happy happy to share them. Um, yeah, I haven't seen anything specific around um, cooling and heating in particular, though. It would vary so much globally. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine the the needs in sub-Saharan Africa versus the, the needs in say developing places in in the Andes here in Latin America or Southeast Asia are going to be so variable. Um, let's see, are there any other, I'm sorry, Chris, did you have a comment? No, I would agree with what you just said. Okay. Uh, are there any other, uh, questions from the group? I guess we've, we've field a couple of questions, but, um, is there any other, uh, uh, audience members who would like to, to address our panel? I have a question I'll throw out then to the rest of the panel, if that's okay. So uh, the latest IPCC report, we've been saying how the tone is entirely different. I have been shocked uh, reading the report, by the way, the tone is entirely different. Um, I, it's, it's a remarkable change, even from AR5. So 
Um, mm -hmm. I guess if, if anybody else, does anybody have the reason exactly why? What has changed over the past five, six, seven years where, you know, the stated impacts and, and, and science, that tone is, is totally different. And I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time pinpointing what it is that has changed since the last assessment report to warrant this massive change in tone. And again, don't get me wrong. I, I am very fearful when it comes to climate change. And I hope I didn't give anybody the wrong impression. I think it's an enormous problem, but I'm worried the tone of, of doom and gloom. Chris, you must love it. But, um, you know, for, I think I'm worried it's a little, I'm, a little, I'm worried it's a little over the top and it might scare some people away um, with that tone. So I'm almost worried it's going to have a, a counter effect. But if anybody can point to the science that's changed only in the last five to seven years, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding that. I don't think it to do with the fact that we have more data that more strongly supports all along thing we see. Don't you think it has more to do with the fact that we're racing towards tipping and it's like, don't look up. <laughs> no, that's the movie. Don't look up. It's nothing. It's gonna pass. And I, and and there is a within with it, some of us in the scientific community, there's a inability to sleep at night in fear of if we do not do this, we are reaching those tipping points and the world is not ready for what that means. Yeah, that could be a, my, um, I don't know for sure, but my initial reaction was more in terms of just as time has gone on, I think, most people have some kind of personal experience or just their own kind of sense of change that's been occurring in their own backyard or their own region that you just you just see there's something different going on than from when you were a kid, for example. Um, and, you know, I don't know if that played directly into some of the tone here, but I mean, man, it sure makes me think about it a lot more when I see it personally um, and locally. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. But I think oh, yes. is an interesting ahead, point though, because who reads the IPCC? You, you mentioned this Susan too, in, in the past point that, uh, the, the people watching Fox news tonight are not going to pick up the IPCC and, and read. Well, those who have never read it, even those who are interested in climate change, don't realize how massive this report is or how, mm -hmm. and how it's collected the data is collected and, and reviewed. So, um, but yeah, it, it is a bit probably Adam of preaching to the choir, and I was, I was, I appreciated the song they were singing. <laughs> well said. <laughs> One of the things I noticed just in reading between AR five and AR six is that a couple key elements of, especially in working group one, was that there was a higher confidence level about um, uh, certain atmospheric forcings. Um, the effects of certain feedback loops that are kind of the, the, the evidence is coming in. So the, 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 the confidence level has been increasing. So I, I imagine that the, the whole group, um, which is, you know, experts, multiple experts from some countries, but, but from countries across the world, the group is, 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 is probably ratcheting up the, the language and feeling more comfortable ratcheting up the language as their confidence increases in the potential negative impacts. And so that was kind of something I noticed because there was a couple of claims that were in both AR5 and AR6, but then they were, they were very high confidence in AR6, but they were only like medium or high confidence in AR5. And so maybe there has something to, to, to do there. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. There's so many high confidence, almost every impact uh, across the board, the confidence levels have gone up rather dramatically. Um, in fact, there's very, those low confidence things are almost non-existent right now, which I find that is just as surprising to me as is the change in tone. Great. So one, one last thing, if I could. Adam, when I was a student in your climate policy class, I think it was 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, we looked at the fact that all through all of these from Kyoto back all the way back, right? We set these parameters for we're going to do this. Paris Accord, we're going to do this. Adam, how many of those countries that, that agreed to do this have actually come through and done them? 
Very few. Uh, very few. And quite frankly, that's why when everybody was patting themselves on the back after Paris, I told my classes at the time then, I said, I don't know why everybody's celebrating. I predict this is going to have almost zero impact. Yeah. And yeah. I hate to say I told you so, but I told you it, it's not the it's a non-binding, um, you know, it, it's, it just didn't have an appreciable difference. And um, yeah. It's unfortunate, uh, you know. It's it's uh, we're 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 not solving the problem right now. We're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, would would the three of you have time for one more question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rachel, you had a, a, a question for the panel. Can you hear us? Can we hear you? I can hear you. Yes. Great. Um. So my question. So Adam, one of your comments resonated with me on a personal level, because I literally ask this to people all the time, when you mentioned how in the US we are constantly overheating buildings in the winter and overcooling them in the summer. And it drives me crazy, both because it's uncomfortable and also because it wastes so much energy. And something I just, and it bothers me, because I remember the first time I felt, I felt like I, I remember going to Poland and I was like, wow, they don't, oh, like it actually is comfortable. And I was just like, how can we address this as an issue in the United States? Like there's so many different levels and to addressing it. And I just wondered if you had any ideas of where to even begin. That is a million dollar question. If you ever get a good answer to that, please let me know. Um, I, 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 it's just, it's the saddest thing. I mean, literally in the, <laughs> our windows are always open because whatever it is, we want the outside air coming, coming in. So uh, right now the heat is still blaring on in my building. So we have to leave the windows open when it's cold out to cool off. I mean, what a ridiculous, inefficient thing. So no, I, I wish I had an answer for you. Unfortunately, I do not. Um, I, I don't know. I would love to speculate, but that would probably be silly. So uh, again, if you ever come back to me, if you ever come back with, a, with an answer, please let me know and uh, I'll pass that along. Okay, thank you. I do, I, I do remember uh, as a kid, this is, now this is the nice point where uh, I can be the elder here. Um, I do remember in the 70s as a kid when we had the energy crisis and the president could not enact obviously to tell you to have your thermostat, but there was a huge educational component of that. And it was tied to, to patriotism. It was, try, it was tied to doing something for your country and for your community and for your family. And, and by putting that together, you know, people were lowering the temperature during the winter and, 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 and sacrificing for their country. And, and so it comes back to that social structure, right? Susan, and, and so if we can con if we can get to people either on a financial level or on some religious level or on a patriotic level, we're probably more likely to see them act be based on emotion because people are emotional creatures like me. If it starts hitting their wallet, then they're going to act. If energy prices keep going up, then perhaps that will produce that, that change. Yeah, I was going to say, let's put a price on carbon. I think we'd see a lot of the inefficiencies go away. We can put a price on carbon, right? Um, that was my initial reaction to that question. Yeah, yeah I, I wish that. Uh, go ahead, Chris. But but again, the problem is, look, where where are the prices of gas? Uh, I I just bought gas here in Peru, and it was about mm, almost seven dollars a gallon, right? I premium. It's nowhere near that in the U.S., but. How many people are ready to vote Republican because those stupid Democrats have raised the price of gas and oil and, and have ruined everything? And, and so it comes back to an illogical, emotional reaction. Yeah. And that's where that's human nature in general. So we're going to have to deal with it on that level, I believe. Uh, see, this is where we have to argue offline, Chris. I look forward to it. Let's do it. Maybe that's a good note to end on. <laughs> I, I wish that our, our, our president of our organization um, was here. She's involved in smart buildings and the, the building uh, uh, environments. So uh, Rachel, that's a, a conversation we can certainly have with, with Emily. She's, she's got okay, some Okay, I'll have to so. pick her brain. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all so, so, so much. Um,
Chris Larson, Susan Clark, Adam Paulstein, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, this is, again, part of a, uh, a series of virtual events um, that we are, are, are hosting for our run-up to fundraising events in New York and D.C. in June. Um, so uh, if you'd like to, to, to see more ways that you can participate in Earth Day events, please visit www.earthday.org, where you can find this and many other events from around the world going on this week, and I believe next week as well. They have some scheduled for next week as well. So uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you again to, to those of you in the audience um, for participating. We really appreciate your support. Um, uh, have a good night. Uh, if you get a chance, read the IPCC report that just came out recently, the, the several of them. They're, they're very enlightening. There's a lot of really great information in there. A lot of that is, is topics that we talked about tonight. Um, uh, our organization is, is definitely hard on the mitigation side and, and you know, we, we're, we're just kind of rolling up our sleeves and getting some projects done. Um, it's not perfect. Very rarely anything in Peru is perfect as those of us who have traveled to places like this know, but we are very motivated to, uh, to uh, 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 spend our resources that we, we get from donors, which we're so grateful for. Uh, in, in improving lives here and, of course, reducing emissions. Uh, we acknowledge that Peru and countries like it in Latin America and across Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia are going to play a, a, an outsized role uh, in future emissions as we move into kind of some of these dangerous periods in climate change in the coming decades. So, uh, again, thank you so much for your time tonight and uh, look for updates on our website and uh, have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you Clint. for organizing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye, Clint. Bye-bye. Thanks, Clint.